Uh, again, welcome this morning uh, to our participants and to our guest speakers, of whom I'll introduce um, in a few moments. I just want to quickly uh, remind everyone who's participating, uh, if you could kindly keep your microphones uh, on mute. During the program, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and it does bear mentioning you know, that this is being recorded. So um, if you're not comfortable with being on the camera, then you know, please uh, turn it off as you see fit. And we ask that everyone please be respectful of one another uh, throughout participating in the forum. Uh, you know, we want the audience to engage as much as possible through the chat box. So please feel free to ask your questions in the chat box, make comments, engage with one another as well. Uh, and uh, as one of our uh, sponsors this morning, Centara is offering gift vouchers to one of their restaurants in the hotel. And this gift voucher will be given to the participant who is most engaging today in our forum. So again, you know, be in that chat box with your questions, with your comments. We, we want you all to be involved in this as much as possible. Um, and the vouchers will be given away toward the end. So please stay with us through the entire program if you'd like to have an opportunity to win those vouchers. And um, I just want to briefly describe what we're talking about today, which is the glass ceiling. Um, it is a term that was actually coined in 1978 at a women's exposition. And it's really about the social barrier preventing women from being promoted to jobs of uh, management and executives. And in the years, this has also been um, in, to include people um, who are of minority groups as well. And, um, you know, this is uh, something that women have been struggling with for you know, <laughs> ever. <laughs> but we have two lovely speakers joining us today who are women that have been able to break through this barrier um, and be successful in their careers. And so the first one is Miss um, Israt. She is currently the um, running the Richmond Consultants and Services Company here in Qatar. She is registered under the Qatar Financial Center and she's been operating here in the corporate finance sector since 2016. But she does have a vast background in, within her role here of, of, of owning her own business. She has worked through the Middle East and Asia, um, in Canada, and we are excited to have her join us here today. So we thank you, Isra. And we also have Miss um, Ashley. She is currently working through, well, excuse me, with the Qatar Civil Aviation Authority at Hamad International. She is an air traffic control officer um, who has a lot of experience uh, in this um, workforce sector. And she is joining us today as well to talk about how she was able to move through um, different positions to find herself working um, at, at Hamad here in, in Qatar. And so we thank you, Ashley, for taking the time out to join us today. Um, <clears throat> so with that being said, we want to jump right in here. So again, audience, please get in that chat box. If you have any questions as our speakers are uh, talking, you know, put them in there. We'd like to know how you ladies are feeling this morning about joining us for this um, online Q&A. So if you wanna get in the chat box there or use an icon um, over your um, Zoom video box, give us a little icon on how you're feeling. Yes, Vika, I love the little uh, party <laughs> icon there. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right. so. We'll get right in. Let's um, ask each of our speakers to briefly talk about what 
is your definition of glass ceiling and one example in your life where you have been able to break through that barrier. Let's start with uh, Isra. Thank you, Zimara, for this opportunity. And I would also like to thank Doha Women Forum uh, for uh, having a discussion on this uh, glass breaking of glass ceiling, which is, uh, I think, very much uh, needed at this point in time, where you know you can see that you know uh, most of the industry uh, still we see the at the top level male are there. Though we are talking about equal opportunity, but still women are contributing 48% uh, in general in most of the you know, economy, but at the top level, still it's less than 20%. And if we talk about uh, the CEO position, it's very low. So it clearly shows when there are almost 50-50 male and women at the workforce, but why there are very few representation of women at the top level. So clearly there is a barrier. And to me, that, that, that barrier you cannot see, but only women in the organization, they can fill. See the men, they will not fill that barrier. For them, you know, they, they are hearing that you know, sky is the limit, that you can accomplish anything if you want. But you know, for women, there is, there is an invisible barrier to cross above certain limit within the organization, that's in, in society, even that's in your family. So to me, that is the cross thing. So I hope that answers, you know, your question, Zumara. And uh... yes, thank you, Isra. Um, Ashley, if you'd like to um, give your take on the same question, uh, how would you define the glass ceiling, and what is an example um, in your own experience in which you were able to break through? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, thank you. You as well as Mara for the opportunity. Uh, I'm like so passionate about this topic uh, and also for Doha Women Forum for reaching out. Uh, for me, the glass ceiling, I think is just an unacknowledged barrier to advancement that, uh, like you said earlier, is mainly affecting uh, women and minorities. Um, I absolutely think it exists. Um, I was uh, in the US Navy for six years uh, before uh, my air traffic career outside of the Navy. And I faced so many challenges um, as a woman in the military. I was young, I was uh, you know, hungry to, to go to the top. And it's like, when you get there, it's never a question or, or, or praise of like, good job. It's like, how did she get there? You know, and it's not in an, in an aspect of your brain or your mind or your, your job performance. It's, it's always in a kind of like a derogative manner, like, uh, is it because of, of looks? Is it because what did she do for him? Um, those kinds of things, I think, that also bring up a lot of issues. And I think uh, women in, in leadership roles and, and high management, you know, you're always facing, uh, how am I going to prove myself? Uh, I can't show weakness. I can't. There's so many things that we have to consider, uh, you know, when we get into these roles. And uh, I think that's what is a good discussion today to talk about is like how to not feel that way and how to know that we are bosses and um, and how we're going to continue to to show women to continue to be amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, both you and um, Isra actually um, really hit on some great points that are often faced by women um, when they move up in the ranks uh, within their careers. Um, so in, in your explanation of glass ceiling and how it affects women in, in their careers, I would like to go back um, and ask 
uh, Isra. Um, how, or not really how, but Nur, what does it mean to you, um, not just as a woman, but um, a woman of Asian descent, to be in a foreign country and have accomplished so much in a male dominated industry? And if you could also um, just lightly touch on how cultures within different countries play a role on how you are perceived in a position of authority. Thank you, Zumara, again. Um, to start with, uh, you know, uh, I have to uh, mention the beginning of my journey as a woman entrepreneur. So I th thought of registering my own company back in 2015 when I decided to resign from uh, my career and start my own corporate financial advisory company. My biggest challenge was to find a Qatari partner, particularly a female partner, because see, this is the challenge because when a man, they decides to do a business there is no limitation uh, you know, from the family that you can do up to this or you cannot do this. Like for me, my husband, he specifically told me, if you want to do a business, you have to find a female Qatari partner. So, you know, this, I understand maybe this might sound very simple, but you know, that is a limitation. So that is an additional challenge you are in a foreign land where you are looking for a sponsor, looking for a sponsor is a challenging. And when you are being specified with criteria that it has to be a female partner. So it took time for me, almost a year to find the right female partner. And then again, after the registration, you know, uh, while getting all the approvals because uh, doing a financial advisory consultancy requires some additional approvals, I found discrimination. And that discrimination I found like, this is based on, you know, that uh, I would say that cultural acceptance. So, um, you know, I can just give you an example, like uh, getting visa as the owner of the company, it took six months and it was turned down four times. So you can imagine how challenging it was to even start the business. And then- uh, and, oh, Sorry, Israb, I I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to, to follow up on a point that, that you were saying before you move on, which is, um, can you just really discuss what mindset you needed to stay in every time you were rejected? You know, what kept you going? What was the mindset that kept you going through these rejections that finally led to the acceptance? Actually, uh, the first is all my life, in all my career, I have experienced additional challenge as a woman and I, I, I went during, uh, throughout my career, I also faced challenge uh, as a Asian woman. So, you know, and challenge is something always drive me. I am very persuasive. I, uh, I have patience and definitely every time they rejected that made me more stronger to request for next approval. I like that perseverance. That, that's, that's the takeaway that I get is, is that you have perseverance and that we, we need to have that as one of the tools um, in, in order to, to succeed and um, face these challenges um, of rejections. So I do appreciate um, you, you sharing that personal experience with us. Um, and I, I would like to, to go with that um, in asking our next question to Ashley. Um, you talked about your military experience um, and I myself 
uh, am an army brat. My grandfather served in the military. My father served in the military. My husband served in the military. <laughs> oh, <awesome. laughs> so um, I understand um, what uh, life for a woman in the military is, is like um, as well. I have a lot of female friends who served as well um, in and out of combat. So how did being in that very male uh, dominated uh, world uh, within the military, um, you know, how were you able to excel uh, and face the challenges that were given to you as um, a woman in the military, but also how did facing those challenge help you to become better or, or to be more successful in your career? Um, I think honestly, it's, it's having the confidence and, and being consistent. I think those are two like really important things to, to touch on. Um, you know, being, being a female in the military, you are a minority. You, there's maybe on an aircraft carrier ratio of 10 men to one woman. And, um, I mean, at any, any time you show any sign of weakness, they, they jump on that, you know, they, they want to see that. And you always had to be strong, you know, if, if you wanted to cry, you don't do it in front of people. You, you go to the bathroom and, and take a break and come back and, and come back with your, with your confidence back and, and being strong. And uh, it was hard, it, it was hard. I won't lie to anybody. It, it was very difficult at times. Um, and, but I think that that over the years, what it's given me now, the confidence that I've needed to be where I'm at now. Um, I actually got out of the military and I volunteered myself to go to Afghanistan as a civil uh, private contracting. And I think everything that I learned in the military helped me to succeed there um, because I also faced the, the woman barrier there of um, it's, it's very new still in Afghanistan for women to be in leadership positions. And I was a supervisor. Um, so I, I think that, that having those breakdowns and those, and those moments in the military really helped me to deal with the, um, the cultural difference of a woman being in charge there in Afghanistan. And uh, that's, that's my big thing is just being confident and being consistent in everything you say and that you're doing, because once you show any sign of inconsistency, you're going to be questioned. You're going to be, uh, you know, picked at every moment. It's like, okay, well, you say this today, but why did you say this yesterday? And um, I think, yeah, consistency and confidence is, is the big thing to take away from all of it. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. I like that. I like that you and Israt, you know, talk about thriving on challenge, having patience, being confident, being consistent. Um, and in reading some of the comments that are coming from the participants here, right, you know, um, one here is actually mentioned the um, how we do have a, a large population here of what are called trailing spouses. And generally it's the women who are following their husbands for their career. Um, and, you know, um, Sabika pointed out that these are a rich and highly talented group of women who are coming here with their spouses. You know, I myself have met them, they're doctors, they're lawyers, <laughs> you know, um, and they're here and, and unable to work because of the barriers that go along with uh, the rules and regulations um, as it's brought, brought up, that can be an additional barrier to, to women being successful in other countries. Um, so uh, I would like to, to take it back to, to Israt first um, for this um, and in line with these um, additional barriers and costs, what can women do to, um, to prepare themselves 
Um, maybe we have someone joining us who's going to find themselves transitioning again with their spouse. So what are some suggestions you have for women to be able to prepare themselves for these transitions and, and maybe go in and find a place for, uh, of work in these different countries? Yes. Uh, Ziomara, thank you again. And I can very much relate to this specific uh, comment from the audience. Actually, I trailed to Qatar uh, uh, with my husband 2008 when I was at my career peak. So I was a CEO of a Canadian organization in Bangladesh. So unfortunately, I had to let go of my career and uh, move to Qatar with my four children. And, you know, uh, initially, this is how I felt that, you know, um, I am. Uh, sitting at home mom, I didn't have my career, you know, uh, and so what I did is my first, uh, first thing which came into my mind is that I need to find a platform. So I went back to my career and I have seen that where I can excel myself easily and what are the skills I can use in this same marketplace and where that skill set is not available. And I'm very proud to say that, you know, I joined back at HSBC in 2010 and I was the first female corporate bank manager, which means corporate relationship manager. I was the first in uh, HSBC Qatar. Amazing. Yes, so I thought of it, I, 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 I left my banking career in Bangladesh in 2003. But, you know, after uh, coming back to Qatar, because I already served organization as CEO, I served organization in top management. And this is something I realized that, you know, at this point, I have to prove myself in this market. And to prove that I need to have a platform. And that's how, instead of looking at a CEO position or a senior management position, I joined as a corporate relationship manager where I could use my skills because uh, for a good corporate relationship manager, I need the analytical skill, I need the financial analysis skill, negotiation skill, relationship management skills. Those are something I can use everywhere. So this is what I would suggest, look into yourself and see what are the skill sets you have developed throughout your career where you were, and you can use your those skill sets no matter where you are. So try to find out a platform to use that skill set. It, it might not be same, but it will give you an opportunity to excel. Then you can prove yourself. I and that's actually a great, great answer. Um, you're right. There are a lot of skills that we have in the workplace that transition into different areas. And, you know, we can make the use of our time um, if we're not working to grow our skills, to hone our skills, maybe even learn some new skills. Um, so uh, I, I even made a note for myself there on that one. I, I really like that idea. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so um, I would like to ask Ashley, and please, audience, uh, if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. So, you know, get those comments, get those questions in the box. Remember, the more you engage, the more chance you have to win one of the lovely gift vouchers being given by Centara. Um, and, and, um, Ashley, uh, Israt said something that I thought was interesting, which is that, you know, and you kind of touched on it a little bit too, which is about how, you know, women have to present themselves in a certain way as to not appear weak or less than, um, which is not a challenge that men typically face when they're in positions of authority. Um, and so when there's a term that I would like to, to bring up and, and maybe you can, maybe you have experience with this where um, there's something known as a glass cliff that they often put women on. 
um, which is that they will promote women to positions of power in times of crisis when they're more likely to fail because they're already being put into this position when things are not running smoothly. Um, and considering that you yourself actually work in a very high stress job environment, um, can you talk a little bit about um, have you experienced this glass cliff or do you know women who have um, and how to navigate that situation? Um, I don't think personally that I have experienced the glass cliff. Um, I think that I've always tried to strive to put myself like above the ceiling so that I, I don't get in a position to where I feel stressed and then more gets thrown on top of me. Um, I definitely have friends that have experienced that. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a very fine line um, between, um, I guess, like being a woman and also having those male dominant leadership traits that you have to show. And I think that that plays a super important role when you, when you face challenges like this, because you're always going to be overwhelmed if you, if you, if you feeling that you're on that line, you know? So I think that just, just, you need to put yourself above the cliff. Don't get yourself in a position to be there because then that puts you in a position to fail, which failure is not bad. We all, we all fail. We've all been rejected, uh, which gives us a chance to, to, to grow. Um, but I think that if you start off strong and you, in your consistency, your confidence, um, you, you, just continue to, to strive for more and show that you can handle that. I don't think you can put yourself really in a position to be on a cliff unless you allow it. I, I, like, I like that thought, which is, it's almost like this, um, this idea of, of always thinking ahead, trying to be ahead. Um, and then real quickly, I would like to follow up with that. You know, do you think that because this is the mindset that's required for women when they are in positions of power and authority, that it puts um, not just additional stress, but that it puts more um, work on women because it's like you're having to be this thing or be this way um, that men don't have to necessarily consider. Um, I think, I don't know if stress is the right word. I would say, yeah, it is, it is a stress depending on, uh, the stress levels that, that you as a person can, can take or handle. Um, like you said, with my job, it, it is very stressful. It's, it's nuts, like 98% of the time. Um, so for me, I don't feel that it's stressful. I feel it's a character trait. I feel that it's, it goes back to having that, that confidence that I was speaking about earlier. Uh, because we need to lead by example now. So if it feels like a stress, then I think that you kind of need to reevaluate a little bit to, to yourself and and take that that time to maybe journal or write it down because we're here now to to show examples to these young ladies and children that you know that 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 you are capable of being in jobs like this and CEOs and and it's okay and if we show the stress, then they feel the stress. So I think that, that we have to show the confidence, lead with confidence, lead with strength. And, and our young ladies will, will grow up to know that it's not a stress. It's not a, a cliff. It's, it's this is normal. This is where I should be. This is where I'm, I'm going to be, you know, in those aspirations growing up. Oh, thank you. That was, a, that was an excellent answer. I appreciate that. Um, we have a question here from Michelle. So, Michelle, um, if you would like to unmute, feel free to ask the question you typed here, or if you would prefer me to read the question, I can do oh, that no, well. that's... Hi, no. Michelle. Good morning, everybody. It's a wonderful discussion. And as Ashley mentioned about um, having to apply male dominant leadership traits in the workplace to show that you are capable. Um, the term that she used, male dominant leadership traits, it just rang a bell with me. And I was just curious, Ashley, what are some of the 
few or the most um, common male dominant leadership traits that women in leadership struggle to actually apply in the workplace. I mean, we could call them just leadership traits, but but I know because there are dif there are differences, we can see them as male dominant leadership traits that actually help propel uh, women uh, in their career progression. So I was just curious, Ashley, if you could share maybe one or two leadership traits that women typically struggle with applying that can be categorized as male dominant leadership traits. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, and this, this probably sounds like a bad word, but I think arrogance is one, but I think that arrogance is also, um, if you apply it correctly, it's very beneficial, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that, that us women, uh, if we come across as being arrogant or, you know, like kind of holding our head a little bit higher some days, I think that's one trait that, that we struggle with uh, as applying because we can come off as being um, bossy or emotional. Um, these words are always used uh, when we're trying to apply the same traits that men do. So I think that's the fine line of, of our, our one example is, is to show a, a, a good arrogance, you know, a confidence. Um, and I think that we do struggle with that. Like, is, was I being, was that too much? Was that, was I too passive? Uh, was I being mean? You know, I think these are all questions that we face, but, um, but I, I think that's, that's one of the, definitely the traits that we struggle with, uh, coming across in a way that's not emotional or, or bossy or too much. Can um, I add one more thing with this, uh, Ashley's you know, in workplace, particularly as a leader, so women, when they become go-getter, get, actually that, that, will, uh, that you need to be an achiever, to be a good leader. But the same go-getter attitude from a woman is always misconstrued as aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Arrogance. Whereas same go-getter attitude from a male, employ your male uh, leader will be applauded. He's praised, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's praised for that same attitude. Yeah. That was a great question, um, Michelle. Thank you for that. And Ashley and Scott, you brought up really um, good points and we appreciate you providing your perspective um, based on what Michelle was asking. We have another audience question here. Dipti, do you want to ask or would you prefer I present it? Uh, hi, Shomara, how are you? Hi, good morning, Deepthi, I'm fine. <laughs> um, okay, I was actually, this is quite an interesting discussion and uh, I just wanted to ask whether like, uh, I mean, have you faced as a woman leader, men, uh, a reluctance from men to, you know, follow uh, women leaders? Uh, like uh, Isratha just saying that arrogance, uh, I mean, it, it is, uh, I mean, it, when it's a woman who's speaking, it comes off in a different way. So have you faced any kind of a reluctance in accepting women leadership? at your workplaces or uh, wherever? Because I've personally felt that. So I was just wondering if it's a common thing or uh, <laughs> just for uh, some people. Should I take this? Or Ashley, you want to take this? No, go ahead, I'll, I'll follow up on you. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did not uh, get your name correctly. Uh, the participant who raised this question? Uh, it's Dipti. Dipti, hi Dipti, uh, Srat here. Um, unfortunately, this is the biggest challenge, uh, you know, and this is not only from male colleagues. I have experienced this because um, I uh, work as senior man management position in a number of organizations. And uh, I always felt that it's not only the male colleagues, even the female colleagues, they question leadership, women leadership. So you will be surprised in real life, I was not only questioned by my male colleagues, it's also from my female colleagues. They even tend to, you know, uh, get, uh, they, they even, uh, you know, uh, get defensive when you're getting an instruction from a female boss or female supervisor. So it's so not- what is 
So how do we uh, overcome that? What is the way, best way to get over it? Uh, the best way uh, to get over is, is trying to build relationships. And prove yourself as leader. And when you prove yourself, this is this is why it becomes very challenging, because as a leader, you have to be the role model for your uh, for your, you know, uh, employee, for your subordinates, for your even for your peers. So you always have to be the role model. Model. This is the additional, uh, you know, uh, pressure women in leadership they face. You know, they have to be a role model for everybody. They have to be role model to their colleagues, to their peers, to their subordinates, to their teammates. So they have to be the best all the time. You know, as Ashley mentioned that, you know, they cannot make mistakes or their mistakes will be highlighted. They cannot be inconsistent. So, you know, those are the points you have to remember. You have to always remind yourself. Okay, okay. thank all you. Right. Thank you, Sarat. Yes, thank you. And Ashley, if you would like to um, give your perspective on that as well, um, and also your thoughts on why women uh, employees will question their uh, female supervisors. Yeah, I think the, the thing that you, well, that I've observed is you have to build the trust. You have to build trust anywhere, no matter what position that you're in, even if you're you're just a, a regular employee, I think that you as the employee also need to build the trust with your supervisor. So I feel like if you're being questioned that the trust isn't there, you haven't built like, like Isra said, that relationship. And for me, I always learned that, uh, and this was probably the best thing I learned in the military, that uh, initially if you have an issue with anybody, uh, take it one-on-one -on -one first, find out what's going on with them. Maybe they have things going on in life that you don't know about. And it just happened to come across that day as being uh, rude or negative or disrespectful. Um, I think that you have to find the, the core of the issue if that's happening. And then you, you go from there. If things don't change after that, then bring a third party in, you know, and then work your way from there. Use your, uh, I guess, chain of command or, you know, your, your steps uh, appropriately. Um, but I definitely think that you need to find the core of the issue first uh, with that person one-on-one, -on -one. build the trust, build that relationship, and then go from there. I think that's the best, uh, the best answer for that. Um, I have seen it. Um, I can probably say I'm, I've even been guilty of it when I was younger, you know, trying to to show that strength or, you know, you, you think it's uh, doing good, but sometimes it's not. So, I think we've all been a little bit guilty of it, to be honest, if you agree or not, in some aspects of our lives at some age. But um, yeah, definitely find the core of the issue and then and then build from that. Um, yes, the good point, right? That sometimes it is just a matter of, of being able to have that good work relationship and trusting each other um, and feeling and confident. Like you said, you don't know people's past. So it could be that they've become a, a female counterpart has become jaded from past experience. And we have to remember that each of us are individuals and we should um, accept each other in that way and, and lift each other up as women. Um, you know, particularly if you are a position of authority, right? Um, it's helping to help bring others along um, and, and mentor them in, in this path to, to leadership. Uh, we have another audience question, and uh, this may be the last one. We'll see, you know, maybe one or two. Uh, Sabika, if you would like to ask your question or I can ask on your behalf. And thank you very much. And um, thank you to all the speakers as well. Um, I guess my question is that I know myself, I work in a very male dominated environment. Uh, I work in a university, majority of the professors are male. Um, and uh, in fact, actually, most of the administration is female. So there is there seems to be this very clear kind of a dichotomy that exists. But um, regardless, uh, I mean, have you noticed in while working in a male-dominated environment, that the shift towards you um, 
has changed. The dynamics have changed, uh, whether it's between men and women or whether it's just with you because you've managed to prove um, yourself and built that trust. Mm -hmm. I was just see, trying to look at the positive side of it, I suppose. Yeah, um, I guess like that. Yeah, uh, I do think there is positives. I think that that even like we talk about a lot of negatives here and a lot of um, struggles that we go through, but I, I do think that 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 those build the positive aspects moving forward. Uh, being able to um, to handle the stresses and and being in a position to where you start seeing more women in a leadership role and kind of like balancing it out. Uh, I do see it, and I, I've seen it even here in Qatar with, with the Civil Aviation Authority, and it's amazing uh, with the government. Um, you know, you have women uh, supervisors here and, you know, women that are in managerial positions, and, and it's wonderful. Like, I love seeing it. So I do think that, that there is positive change coming um, slowly, I, definitely slowly, but, it, but it's coming, and I think that it's going to be absolutely amazing when, when we get it all balanced and figured out, I guess. <laughs> And uh, Israz, if you'd like to give your perspective on um, the positive shift uh, definitely. Uh, from colleagues as a woman of, of power and authority in the workplace. Uh, truly speaking, yes, I can uh, see uh, that uh, shift and uh, particularly even within the business uh, community, I can feel that like, uh, you know, uh, me being in a lot of uh, other associations uh, or other forums, uh, the business forums, I can see that, you know, uh, the men they are now, they understand these challenges and a lot of, lot of uh, organizations, uh, you know, which are run by, you know, males, they are coming up with, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, changes within the organizations, like they're coming up with this, uh, you know, part-time uh, times, not only for female, also for uh, male colleagues, which is something very, very important because, you know, if they, if men, they also get to do the part-time or uh, working from home, so that will, you know, blend the culture or they can see uh, the way the, uh, the um, women, uh, that they see. Uh, so this is a very good change, I would say that this, this is a very positive set, uh, positive change. Oh, good. I, I'm happy to hear that the experience is leaning more toward a positive shift and that more companies are taking an active role in um, having women in roles of, of leadership and accepting them um, in equity uh, as, as part of that leadership team. Um, we are coming towards the end of our program for this morning. Uh, again, I would love to thank all of the participants who took the time out to ask questions, to engage in the chat, um, to our speakers for joining us and sharing these words of wisdom uh, and with us this morning. Thank you again. Um, at this time, uh, Conchita, do we have uh, ah, okay, so I would like to congratulate Ms. Uh, Sabita Shaban and Gloria Rodriguez. You two ladies have won the Centara vouchers, and Kuchita will take care of all of those details with you all and inform you on how you can uh, receive your voucher. So thank you all again. And we- Thank you very much. Oh, of course. <laughs> thank you again for joining us. Uh, and congratulations on winning the vouchers, ladies. Um, at this time, Conchita, if you would like to um, put the information up for our um, feedback survey, uh, we do value uh, the feedback from our audience and speakers as well. Please feel free to complete the survey um, the information will be presented here. We'll just wait for um, Conchita to get that together. Yes, here you go. If you scan the QR code or you um, put the number in at slido.com, you can complete the survey uh, for today's program. Um, again, please do so. We value the feedback and this helps us to improve um, on our uh, programs. 
um, as well as if you would like to suggest topics that might be of interest to the audience, you know, please feel free to um, to to let us know. And um, just quickly, in case the ladies who won the vouchers didn't catch Conchita's message, uh, please send her your mobile number so that she can reach out to um, get all the relevant information to you in order to get your vouchers. Um, so we have a few moments here, and I actually would just like to leave the closing to our speakers. Um, just a few closing words from you, Estas, and you, Ashley. Uh, Xiomara, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as a closing word, I would like to say that, you know, I think uh, now we, we talk we talk about this uh, glass ceiling, but you know uh, we need to now uh, talk about the steps, what we should do, or what our uh, male colleagues they should do, uh, you know, so that uh, we can uh, women or more women get the opportunity to you know break this glass ceiling. I think. Um, the organizations, uh, they, they should uh, try to engage uh, male colleagues in the diversity programs. You know, the organ I have seen that most of the diversity programs, those are dominated by uh, female uh, employees. They should try to engage, uh, involve uh, male colleagues so that, you know, they can really understand, they can understand the issues. Only when you understand the issues, you'll be able to take steps so that is why it's very important to engage the male colleagues. And then, um, you know, uh, there should be a cultural uh, change uh, where, you know, the male colleagues, they, uh, they try to support their uh, female colleagues in advancing their uh, career. Like, you know, when they talk about promotion um, or training, uh, there is a tendency of, you know, uh, referring male colleagues. So this is something actively uh, I would request that the, uh, the male uh, employees, they should actively try to sponsor one of their female colleague. You know, those are the things, you know, at the organization level, there should be, uh, you know, some change. And this will make a huge difference for uh, women or minorities at the workplace. And uh, thank you very much again, Ziomara, uh, uh, Doha uh, Women Forum, and Conchita. It was really a great opportunity. And thank you very much to all the participants who joined us today. And I really, really appreciate this effort. I hope Doha Forum, Women Forum, they would organize more such events. Uh, thank you for that, Isra. Uh, Ashley? Yeah, uh, first, just thank all of you guys so much for your time. Um, I know that we all have crazy things to do in life. And, and so I really appreciate everybody here for, for your time. Um, I guess my, my thing I'd like to, to say today um, is if anyone here is like struggling with, with um, breaking this glass ceiling, um, just continue to, 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 to strive. Don't be scared. Um, just know that, that you're not the only one as well. Like, you know, we've either all have been there or there's people going through it. Um, and yeah, be confident, be so confident, like let everyone feel it because, um, that's, what's going to get you everywhere. Um, and, and not just so much of being confident, but also feel it, like feel within yourself that, that you have that, that strength to, to do amazing things, to pursue your dreams, or, or if you feel you're not at a place to, to, to push anymore, then, then have that, that confidence and that strength to, to show a younger woman uh, that she can also do these things. She can be in these, these leadership positions. She can have these jobs. Um, so yeah, just keep being awesome. Keep uh, smiling and just know that, that we're going we're gonna to break this all around uh, in time. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that, Ashley and Isat. 
for your words of encouragement um, and for you know being the example for women to excel in positions of power and authority. Um, so again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us. I would like to mention again uh, to the sponsors, Centara West Bay and to Instituto de Oda uh, Borjo here in Qatar for being uh, consistent sponsors of Doha Women's Forum and their initiatives. Again, to Ashley and Nisrat for taking the time out of their day to be here. And of course, Conchita, uh, Doha Women's Forum would not exist without Conchita. She is a woman of few words. However, I would like to leave those few in this minute to her.